This is problem 1833, it's on page 628. Design a helical torsion spring for severe service using stainless steel wire, ASTM A313 type 302, to exert a torque of 12 inch pounds, or pound inches, <coughs> after a deflection of 270 degrees from the free condition. The outside diameter of the coil should be no more than one and, uh, one and a quarter inches. Specify the diameter of a rod on which to mount the spring. All right, so this is a torsion spring. So quick, what, what kind of uh, stress is in the material since it's a torsion sp spring? That's what everyone says, torque. No, there's actually torsional stress in helical springs, okay, in helical compression and extension springs. There is bending stress in helical torsion strength. Okay, because remember, what we've got here is a spring shaped something like this, despite my bad drawing. You're just bending it, right? So imagine that it's all a beam that you haven't curled up, right? All you're doing is you're bending it, so it's bending stress. Gotcha. Okay? Now, as you bend it, what happens? Well, the inside diameter gets smaller. That's why they said, what's the minimum or maximum rod size, I mean, that you can mount this spring on? All the pit latches on my truck are in torsion spring. All the what? The, or the, like, instead of shocks, they're the hood springs or the torsion, the coiled springs. Oh, yeah, for the hood? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, coil springs, that's to help raise the yeah. load of the load. load. Yeah. It's like those springs you put on, like, a barbell or something. Yeah. Right, a lot like that. Yep. Okay, so torsion springs. So the, now, you have to be careful because instead of having forces that we're dealing with, we're dealing with moments. Okay, so because the loading is going to be a moment load to this torsion spring. And the operating moment load is 12 inch pounds force. Now be careful. Remember when we had deflection in compression and extension springs? What were the units of the deflection? Length, inches, right? If you have a torsion spring, what is the deflection unit going to be? It would be degrees, right? Or radians, or some angular dimension. Okay? And so the operating angle is 270 degrees. Now, that is the same thing as three-quarter revolutions, and it may be handy to have revolutions. The outside diameter of the spring is one and a quarter inches, and that's, that's a maximum specification. That's not a specification we have to hit. You just have to be less than that. We're supposed to design the spring and find the rod diameter for mounting. So, uh, what I'm going to do is begin with the mean diameter again. The mean diameter means pretty much the same thing it did in uh, compression and extension springs. But if I have some kind of size requirement here, then I may as well go ahead and set the mean diameter so that I can try and reach that size requirement. Okay. Now. When the spring is being operated, is its body size going to go down or go up? Down, right? When it's being operated, its size is going to go down. Now, this is the normal case. You mentioned a barbell case a minute ago. The, the difference there is that it's opposite, right? You, when you press the spring, the, the ends are made such that pulling them together opens it up. So anyway, that's not a normal torsion spring design. So the mean diameter should be pretty close to this. I could make it this, but the problem with that is I wouldn't have any space for the wire diameter. So I'm going to make it one and an eighth inches. Okay, notice I'm using a lot of inches. One of the reasons I'm doing that is because they're still so common. And also, you need to get used to recognizing eighths, sixteenths, thirty seconds, uh, three eighths, all these different things. You need to start recognizing them, recognizing the decimal. I don't know that the mean diameter of my spring is really going to be accurate enough to, for this to be warranted, this five thousandths of an inch. But what I'm saying is one and an eighth is less than one and a quarter. Okay? <clears throat> All right, now, I need some design stress to start with. Remember when we were dealing with uh, extension and compression springs, we dealt with torsional stress? Now, since we're dealing with a torsion spring and bending stress, we need a normal stress. Okay, that's why there's a separate set of charts for torsion spring design. You guys see that, do you have a uh, bookmark yet so that you can find those charts quicker than I can? It would be a really good idea. 620 through 623. Like I said, if you don't, if you haven't tabbed your book, 
These are definitely some of the pages that you need to tab. Now we've already been given a material. Why do you think that we've been given uh, stainless A313 type 302? It's probably some type of corrosive environment. That's the purpose of using this material. Look on page 623 at the bottom of figure 1829. Now, so notice that these are for torsion springs. It's even labeled on the charts. So look at figure 1829. We're supposed to use severe service. What did we do in the context of extension and compression springs? Light service. What's that? Based off light service. Well, we have to base it on severe service, but what did we do to begin with a design parameter, a design stress? It was going halfway in the middle. Halfway in the middle, right. So 170 versus 70. Let's see, I should have grabbed something in the middle. I don't know if I did. Let's see. 110? Close enough. 40. Uh, not exactly in the center, but it's a little bit below center, which is fine. So that's what I did. I said, let's take the design stress to be about 110 KSI. Okay. Now, um, the spring indices for torsion springs are similar to the spring indices for uh, extension and compression springs. In fact, really, all you, the whole purpose for the spring index is so that the, the wire can be bent into that shape and not be just ridiculous. So a spring index of 5 is fine. Now, would you normally use this? You can. It doesn't matter. It needs to be between 5 and 12. Now, last time, so far, all I've done is use 7, right? That's what I've done so far. I'm changing it up just because I want you to see that you can. Okay, so a spring index of 5 should give us a wall correction factor. Now, what equation are we going to use for the wall correction factor? <coughs> Give me an equation number, page number. 825605. How many people want to vote for 185? Same here. Page 605. I've got two votes for it. I agree. You agree? Three votes. How about if I were to put a little B on here for bending? You have to be careful. When you're designing a torsion spring, the wall correction factor is different. Go to page 620 and look at equation 1820. It's because the geometry is a little bit... It's not so much because the geometry is different, because it's still a coil of wire. The reason for the change is because the way that it's stressed is different. So you have to use the bending wall correction factor, not just the wall correction factor. This is for torsion or heel for torsion. Exactly. So here's the here's the short version. 1820 is for torsion springs. And that other one you had is for compression and extension springs. Now, like I said, your author always has an example and the um, he frequently incorporates the solution steps into the example. Now let's see. Um, page 624. Is his example with essentially the steps on it for how you would calculate or how you would design a spring. So you may want to mark this page because this is basically your design procedure. <coughs> now at a spring index of 5, the bending wall correction factor is 1.175. As the spring index goes up, the wall correction factor goes down. So let's say that I decided I wasn't going to use a spring index of 5 instead. Okay. Instead, what I'm going to do is set the wall correction factor. So instead of using 1.175, I chose 1 1.15. Okay. That gives me a slightly higher spring index. Now I can calculate the wire diameter. There is an equation for wire diameter that is the key equation for torsion springs, just like you had the key equation for uh, extension and compression springs. Uh, let's find it quickly. Let's try. He has it in the solution. He does have it in the solution, but I'm looking for the equation number. If you look on page 624, you'll, you'll see the equation. 
it involves the moment, the bending correction factor, the design stress, and the wire diameter, but he has it also in the body of the text somewhere, as I recall. But I don't see it right off. It's the most important equation for torsion springs, and you definitely want to give it a, uh, an equation number. Uh, where is it? It may only be in that example problem. I don't see it in the useful form. I only see it in the useful form in the example problem. So you may want to highlight that equation on page 624. When we find it in the text, I'm sure it's there somewhere. When we find it, I'll point it out. But here it is in its useful form. So anyway, uh, 32 multiplied by the operating moment multiplied by the wall correction factor for bending stress over pi over the design stress to the one third power. That's the equation that we really need. That's the as I said, the key equation for torsion spring design. We know this stuff. Uh, the 32, of course, is just a number. The moment is 12 inch pounds force. The bending wall correction factor we selected is 1.15. Pi is just a number. The um, stress, the design stress, is 110,000 pounds per square inch. So notice the pounds go away. Uh, let's see, we have inches cubed, so when we take the cube root, again we'll have inches of wire diameter, and it's 0 0.1085 inches. There we go, I've got a note, it should be equation 19 rearranged. There it is, I knew it was in there. Go to page 620, yeah, at the bottom of the page, equation 1819. This is equation 1819, just solved for wire diameter. So there's our key equation. Well, they've got rearranged on there, but yeah, it's the same thing. Right, it's the same thing. It's rearranged. Yep. Okay. So now that we've got a wire diameter, now what? Well, let's go back to the standard wire charts. Now, there's, here's, here's the good news. There's not a different wire chart for torsion springs, okay? Which makes sense because you're using the same wire to make either a compression extension or a torsion spring. But which gauge chart should we be on? Is it not music wire? No. Is it a non-ferrous material? No, stainless steel actually has iron in it. It's not metric. We're designing an English unit, so I won't use the metric diameters. So we're on this US steel wire gauge. A lot of students get confused because they think stainless steel doesn't have iron in it, and so they think it shouldn't be a steel wire. It is steel wire. It just has stuff that keeps it from corroding it. That's all. So what, uh, what gauge are we close to? Well, let's see, our number is 0 0.1085. We've got either gauge 11 or gauge 12 is closest, right? Yeah, page 598 is where I'm at. OK. Well, what I did is I chose gauge 11. Let's put it over here. Now this is not a given, so I'm going to put a line there and separate it. Why do you choose so far? What's that? Oh, okay. You just chose the next one up. The next one up. That's all I chose. You I could go you down if you wanted. That's I, I thought you'd go to I was Okay. So that's what I chose. Now, all the stuff I've got so far is pretty much worthless, right? Because now I've changed something. I have changed the wire diameter. That's going to change other things, right? So let's see what happens. Uh, let's leave that there for now. If I choose a wire diameter of 12.05, then how much stress can the material take? Well, let's find out. Go to page 623 again. At a wire diameter, diameter of 120,000 or so, for severe service, what's the maximum bending stress? It's a little less than 120, isn't it? 
Yeah, which chart are you? Which chart are we at? We're on page 623, looking at figure 1829. So a, a wire diameter of 120 thousandths, point one two. Forget that half thousandth, right? We're, yeah. we're not going to read off that chart that accurately. Is there? Oh, uh, I'm sure, it's covered. But how do you accurately say you uh, read off on a chart? Like you can only go to three decimal places on this, but the resolution on it's only. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, what's the reasonable resolution? Yeah, because yeah, you're studying like, variation. Yeah, and it's I get people say, oh, I can read it to four microns. I'm like, yeah, that's funny because it only goes to hundred. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. I don't know if that would be something that I should. Well, you, yeah, you. It's a good idea. It's something we don't have time for, unfortunately. But you're asking about resolution in the chart. Yeah, it's what you can actually read to. <laughs> so, what is the design stress? What's the actual design stress? I started out at 110 KSI. 119. 119 is reasonable. I chose 118. 119 is reasonable. 120 is a little too much, right? Because the line's below 120. So you couldn't say 120. But that's what I chose for my design stress. Okay. Now we can calculate the outer diameter, right? The outer diameter would be uh, 1 and an eighth inches plus the wire diameter itself, 0.1205 inches. Well, that comes out to 1.24. 5, 5 inches, which is less than 1.25, but just barely. We could calculate the inside diameter if we wanted, but that's not really what we're interested in. We want the inside diameter when the spring is operated because it's going to be even smaller. So I'm not really interested in the initial inside diameter, so I won't bother calculating it. How about the spring index? Well, the spring index is still the mean diameter over the wire diameter. The mean diameter 1.125 inches, the wire diameter 0.1205 inches, and that ratio is 9.336, which gives me a bending wall correction factor of about 1.087. Now, once again, I've used the wall correction factor for bending, and I've already pointed out the equation, but it's equation 1820. Okay, well, I'd like to know what the stress actually is at the operating position. So let's figure that part out. Well, how would I do it? Well, I would just use equation 1819 rearranged again, just as it, it was initially. Okay, not really even rearranged at all, just equation 1819. So 32 times the operating moment multiplied by the wall correction factor for bending divided by the pi divided by the wire diameter cubed. Notice we haven't even dealt with the spring index yet, you know, or excuse me, with the uh, spring constant yet, right? What units would the spring constant have? It would be force per deflection, right? So it would be inch pounds per degree, or inch pounds per radian, or inch pounds per revolution. So it depends on what units you want to use to measure the angle. But anyway, we haven't even dealt with the spring constant yet. So this, this K here, is just the wall correction factor for bending. So 32 times uh, 12 inch pounds force multiplied by 1.087 divided by pi, just plug it in the numbers to the equation, divided by the wire diameter, 0 0.1205 inches cubed. Okay, and so the stress comes out to about 75,900 36 actually pounds force per square inch. Do you think that when they make wire diameter it actually comes out this accurately? 1205? There's a nominal and there's a range. That's right, there's a range and nominal. So, do you think we ought to have a little bit of room for error? This is probably a better spring design than the last one we looked at because our operating stress is well below the design stress. Okay? Yeah. Is for the processing wire is they usually have a max diameter and then have a because it, it's generally pull through dot, right? Pull through dot, right. So they would have a max diameter, but they might have a, a this is what the max should be and it shouldn't go any bigger than that because the dot is straight, but we'll have stuff smaller where it's stretched and I don't know much about wire diameters and what their tolerances are. I know it's kind of interesting because the, the gauge numbers 
for wire is the same as the gauge number for sheet metal. So okay. sheet metal thickness is wire similar. gauge. Right? And sheet metal varies a little bit, but it's pretty close. It's yeah. pretty good. You can rely to about a thousandth or so on it. Well, that's yeah. good. And it's probably about the same for wire dye. Because yeah. pulling it through a dye, it's going to come out pretty close <coughs> unless the dye is really warm. Yeah. Or off bomb or something. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Then you got the ge the geometry question. How round is it really? Yeah. How flat is the sheet metal? Well, so far we've done all this and we haven't bothered with the spring constant. So let's calculate the spring constant next. We may as well. The spring constant, I would write it as K sub theta to make it clear I'm not talking about bending wall correction factor. I'm talking about a spring constant for an angular deflection. It would just be the operating moment divided by the operating deflection, right? Because really this is the difference from the free position, but really the, the free position moment is zero, the free deflection is zero, so this is the change, right? So 12 inch pounds force divided by 0.75 revolutions gives us 16 inch pound force per revolution. Now I put it in revolutions instead of degrees, I think we end up using that that way. I think that's what you have to use in the, the equation. But more importantly, this to me makes sense. It takes 16 inch pounds to take one arm and pull it all the way around. It's one revolution. Okay, I can understand that. So it makes even more sense then that 12 inch pounds would be applied when I don't go all the way around. Right? When I go three quarters of the way around, I have three quarters of the, the, the load I would have had. Is that just the ratio? Yeah, it's just a ratio. Basically, that's what K is, is a ratio. Okay, so now I'd like to find out the number of active co coils. Notice the number of active coils always relates to the spring constant. That's true for helical extension and compression springs as well as torsion springs. So let's see. Let's look at uh, the number of active coils. There's an equation for this. It's equation, uh, trying to figure out if it's 1821 or 1822. Uh, let's see, I guess, actually they're the same thing. 1821 and 22 are the same thing. It just depends on what you want out of it. Um, what I want out of it is the number of active coils. And it looks like he doesn't have it solved for the number of active coils. Here it is. The number of active coils is the uh, elastic modulus times the wire diameter to the fourth power divided by 10.2, divided by the mean diameter, divided by the um, spring constant. Now where does that 10.2 come from? Well the 10.2 comes from some constant 64 pi and revolutions to radians conversion. Now here's what you really need. The K naught in equation 1822, that K has to have units of uh, moment per revolution, okay? I want you to make a note of that, that is per revolution. Because that 10.2 has a conversion in it to go from radians to revolutions. <clears throat> and if you don't know that, you can end up with your spring constant wrong and not plug in the right units and not get the right answer. Okay. Now, E is Young's modulus, as you would expect. But we can't just use 30E6. Steel has a springiness of 30E6, right? Everybody knows that. That's an approximate number. Now, it's, it's a good approximation, but it's not as exact as we need it. So let's go back to the, um, the table that has the uh, material properties. It's page 606 for the various materials. So page 606, table 18.4. Now the tension modulus that they mention here, that's just Young's modulus, that's just E. And we're looking at um, stainless steel 302. So what is Young's modulus for stainless steel? You're looking at the shear modulus. You want to look at the, tor at the uh, tension modulus, go over to Young's. Yeah, 28 times 10 to the 6 PSI, okay? Everybody see that? All right, so 28 times 10 to the 6th PSI. The wire diameter that we have selected, <clears throat> 0 0.1205 inches, that has to be raised to the fourth power. 
10.2 is conversion factor with a bunch of stuff in it. Just make sure you've got K theta in inch pounds per revolution. The mean diameter of the spring was 1.125 inches. And then we've got our 16 inch pounds force per revolution. Okay. All right. If you check the units on this, you'll see it comes out uh, dimensionless, essentially. It's the number of active coils. Anyway, it's 32.15 coils. And you plug all this into your calculator. Now think about what we're doing here. We've got a spring. It's like this. And it probably has some arms on it, right? If you apply a force to the spring, what's going to happen to the coils? They're going to bend. What's going to happen to the arms? They're going to bend too. So do you see how the arms contribute some to the springiness of the spring? We have to take that into account. In fact, these arms act like part of the, the active coils. Okay? Whereas the end treatments for extension springs do not. Here they do. So we have to design the ends of the arms as well. I'm going to make the picture a little more accurate this time. How long the arms take? We have to decide that. We're the designers. So that's, this is what we're deciding. So let's just let both arms be the same length. We don't have any particular application, so there's no reason to change the arm length. Notice the effective arm length is just where the force is applied. If the force is applied out at the end, then that's, this will be what it is. But if the force is applied way back here, your effective arm length is just that little bit, right? Because this out here isn't going to bend. So be careful about that when you're designing. Anyway. Kind of like any spring rate right in the middle, and then just length your arms and theory. You really could. Yeah. Yeah, basically, so what's the whole reason for winding this up the way we do it? It's to save space. Yep. Or right, so the spring fits. So the longer these arms are, the you're bigger mechanical advantage, and then you're like a five-bar spring. Yeah. So I'm arbitrarily going to design this at an inch and a half. Why? It doesn't matter. Right? It doesn't matter too much. Now, then, why do I need to do that? Because this is effectively like some some coils. I'm trying to calculate the effect of these coils. So there's an equation. I'm sorry? I just, I'm designing it. So just like taking the mean diameter to be, to be one and an eighth inch. So look at page 620 and equation 1823. This is the equation you use to calculate how many coils these arms are equivalent to. Does that make sense? Make sense? So we need the length of the arms. They're the same, so this is effectively three inches in total. Do you guys see that? L1 plus L2 is just three inches? Yep. Divided by three pi, the threes cancel nicely. That's why I chose an inch and a half, actually. <laughs> the mean diameter, yeah, cheating. The mean <laughs> diameter is 1.125 inches. So the inches go away. So effectively, this is just like having 0.28 coils. There's, these arms act and take care of 0.28 coils that I don't need in the body. Does that make sense? So the number of coils I need in the body are just the number of active coils less the contribution of the ends. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's very simple. That's just 32.15 less 0 0.28. It's hardly worth talking about, right? But I need 31.87 coils in the body of this spring. So right here, I need 31.87 coils. Okay. Believe it or not, we're almost done with our spring design. Now, fortunately, when you're designing a spring like this, the, the coils add length in this direction. A lot of times that doesn't matter. I mean, unless you're talking about a spring that's really, really long so that you have to mount it on a rod for it to be a proper torsion spring. Fortunately, most of the time, the, 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 this length here is not something that's specified. It's something you can calculate easily, though, because typically these, um, and I don't think I did it here, but we may as well, if you guys would grab your calculators. Uh, no, I did do it. Let me, let me make a sketch from the side to show you what I'm talking about. So here's an arm coming down. Here's a body or the body of the torsion spring. Do you guys understand what you're looking at here? 
Okay. This is the spring from, from this view. Okay. So this length can actually be calculated pretty easily. Let's just go ahead and do it since I've made the drawing. It's the wire diameter multiplied by the number of active coils plus one plus the angular deflection at operation. Why? Because at operation, you're basically winding more of the arms onto the coil. So you have to take them into account. So that is 0 0.1205 inches multiplied by number of active, which is um, 31.87. Now let's see. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I've, I've already got the number of active. I've, I've erased it. The number of active was 32.15. Plus one plus three quarters of a revolution, right? Basically one coil is equivalent to one revolution, so I'm adding the same units here. Anyway, so the length of the spring comes out to 4.08 inches. Most of the time, like I said, you don't really care about it. It's just something that you know, something that's a fact. What you do care about, though, is the inside diameter. If you want to mount this thing on a rod, the inside diameter of that coil makes a big difference when you're at the operating position. So when you're at the operating position, it gets smaller, and we need to calculate that effect. Now, this is, I believe, equation 17. Yeah, here we go. Go to page 620 and look at equation 1817. The minimum uh, uh, or the, the diameter, the operating diameter, the operating mean diameter. Now be careful here. What we're doing is we're saying when the spring is operated, when those ends are twisted, the mean diameter becomes something less. Yes. Right? It was 1.125 inches. Now it's going to be less. What size is it? So what's the operating mean diameter? Okay, what does that look like? Well, it's the initial mean diameter. That's what I designed. That's the one in the eighth inches, right? But it's divided by the number of active coils plus uh, the operating uh, angle. Now, I've got a subscript T here. I don't know why I put a T on there. It should be a theta. Yeah, should be theta operating. Okay, so the mean diameter, uh, I'm sorry, multiplied by the number of active coils. I forgot that number here. So the mean diameter was initially one and an eighth inches. We're going to multiply that by the number of active coils, 32.15, divided by the number of active coils, 32.15, plus the operating. Uh, uh, angle or the operating deflection. Okay. So when you plug all this in, what you find is 1.100 inches. It's interesting that the spring changes size by 25 thousandths. That's a significant change when you're talking about a machine design. Now, another thing I want you guys to notice notice that a lot of the equations we're using I have not derived for you. I just sort of said, well, here's kind of where it comes from. This is geometry. Okay. It doesn't matter. You kind of have to get used to that because a lot of times when you design something for using someone else's product, they've got sort of a recipe. Here's an equation. Use this equation, then that equation, then that equation. Use this chart. Look it up in the table. Everything comes out. You're done. Okay. You, a lot of times you will not understand where a lot of this stuff comes from. You may understand pieces of it, like what is this thing? What is this mean diameter? Or what's the stress and what is it supposed to be? But where the equations actually come from is something you may not know. Now, it's obvious that the inside diameter at minimum, in other words, at the operating position, would just be this minimum mean diameter less the wire diameter, right? So that's 1.100 inches less the wire diameter, 0.1205 inches. That comes out to 0 0.9795 inches, okay? Now, would it be a good idea to specify a rod at 0.9795 inches? No. Usually you have a rod in the spring to keep the spring from, from basically just doing nothing, right? Because if you try to twist this, the spring's just going to turn. And so you have to mount it on a rod to prevent it from turning. That way it will actually be a proper torsion spring. Anytime you've noticed that you've taken a, a torsion spring off of a machine, it probably had a rod going through. So what you normally do is you design the diameter of the rod to be about 90%, so 0.9 of the minimum inside diameter. That's the normal, okay? 
Now, um, when you do that with this, obviously we're just going to take 90% of this number. I won't write it out. It's 0.882 inches. Now, when you do that, you're not going to specify a rod that's 0.882 inches. That doesn't make any sense. Because, right, you go to a standard size, a basic size. I would just go to the closest one. What's closest to this? You guys recognize it in decimal? Seven eighths. Seven eighths, that's right. 0.875 is close to this. So I'm going to specify the rod diameter to be 7 eighths of an inch. Now, rod could be oversized, it could be undersized. But I've got a little bit of space from 7 eighths from 0.875 to 0.882, right? So I've got a little bit of room there, a little wiggle room. And I think that's it. We were supposed to specify the minimum rod diameter, or the rod diameter that the spring would be mounted on. We've got the wire diameter that the spring is to be made from. We've got the number of active coils, the length of the arms on the end, and we're done with our design. Okay. Now you have a cure for insomnia. Any questions? Uh, okay. All right.